Aloha, it's Robert Stelic with Blue Planet Surf. Welcome to the very first episode of the Blue Planet Show. I'm here in my home office in the garage and my neighbors are doing construction so you might hear some noises from outside. I'm super excited about this new show. My first interview is with Zane Schweitzer and this show is all about wing foiling and lifestyle and technique and so on, equipment, everything about wing foiling which is what I'm super passionate about right now and I want to uh, know more about it so that's why I want to interview all the, the top thought leaders on the leading edge of the sport, athletes, designers and so on. And uh, next week's interview is going to be with Balz Miller. He's uh, in Switzerland so we got a little big time difference but I'm super excited to get him on the show as well and talk a little bit about his super radical moves in wing foiling. I was inspired to start the show by Eric Antonsen's Progression Project podcast, which if you haven't listened to, you should check it out. I've been listening to it when I'm driving around. It's really a great podcast, and I'm going to post these interviews not only here on YouTube, but also on podcast channels. So um, that's going to be available soon. So if you don't have time to watch the whole thing on video, we will also have this available as podcasts. And I know it's um, pretty long form interviews, but I know if you're into wing foiling as much as I am, you'll be interested to watch the whole thing. So in this video, I asked Zane about his background as a waterman. He started really young as a professional windsurfer and then stand up paddler and then now as a professional foiler and uh, also a coach and teacher. So he has a really good background. And then he talks about an accident he recently had a really deep cut from his foil in the from in the waves and there's a lot of learning experiences that he shares in that so it's good to listen to but the visual is pretty gory and bloody so if you're sensitive to that you might want to skip ahead to around 30 minutes where we start about talking about wing foiling actually wing foiling so and then uh, we talk about wing, wing foiling a bunch and then at the end we talk about life and life during the pandemic, staying positive, having gratitude and so on. And that's actually my favorite part. So stick around for that really good stuff in, in the end too. So I hope you enjoy the show. Without further ado, here is Zane Schweitzer. All right, Zane, thanks so much for joining me. Uh, it's my first time doing this Blue Planet show. So I'm super stoked to have you as my first guest. Uh, welcome. Yeah, thanks so much, Robert. Yeah, it's great to have an opportunity to chat with you again. It's been a while since we've got to connect. So let, let's start a little bit about your, tell me a little bit about yourself and I'm gonna screen share and play some video of you kind of growing up from YouTube. Um, let me see here. I was gonna play this video. So um, can you see that? Yeah. All right, so yeah, tell us a little bit about um, yourself growing up and all that. <laughs> Well, yeah, I grew up uh, here on West Maui over in uh, Kahana and, you know, being surrounded by my big brother who's five years older than me and all his friends and as well my, my parents and all their friends, uh, I got to be surrounded by some pretty amazing watermen and waterwomen. Uh, you know, I, I think my brother really had a huge influence on me though because at that time, all him and his friends were like my heroes, you know, like they were all the up and coming junior pros in the shortboard surf world, like Dusty Payne and Ian Walsh and Granger Larson and Clay Marzo. And, and so I was always chasing those guys around. And so I got introduced to, I guess, big wave surfing at Honolulu Bay uh, at a pretty young age, just chasing them around. And I think big wave surfing really set me on a, a journey, um, to just be super super in tune with the ocean you know when as soon as I started feeling like the excitement of riding big waves uh, that's when I really what felt I was just caught by you know enthralled by the ocean because before that time I was probably more enthralled by my little mongoose bicycle you know? <laughs> but yeah pretty quickly you know started to you know, get into windsurfing and all that kind of stuff. And on the professional tour, I was about 12, 13 years old when I first started on the professional tour for windsurfing. 
Yeah, that really when was. I, when I first met you, that was at the Battle of the Paddle, right? Like um, the second Battle of the Paddle, uh, when you were just a little grum, I think, just um, traveling by yourself doing the race um, when you were still pretty young, yeah? Yeah, and that was years after, too. I was already a pretty <laughs> familiar with traveling at that point by the time stand-up paddling came into into the world. But it, it's kind of cool to see it go first full circle because when I was competing as a professional windsurfer, all of a sudden, starboard started to make these uh, stand-up paddle boards. And, of course, we've heard of them, seeing like guys like Laird Hamilton and Dave Kalama out riding paddle boards and downwinders and stuff, staying fit. But our board sent us, sent me one. Uh, actually, Connor Baxter and I, I believe we're like the first people in the whole country to, to get a stand-up paddle board from Starboard. <laughs> and we had so much fun on them before the windsurf event started. We would um, – we would bring these stand-up paddle events on, on our travels. And, you know, before the wind came up, we would be out on the water, paddling around, catching waves, you know, doing all that kind of stuff. And everywhere we went, people were like, what is that? What, can we try this? Like, and we would, you know, young little 13, 14, 15 year old. And we were like hosting clinics all over the world already at that age, uh, at, at windsurf events, sharing this new sport of stand-up paddling. And, and it's kind of cool to see it come full circle. You know, we, we've seen kind of stand-up paddling go from being, you know, this, this little uh, niche of a thing to the world's fastest growing sport. And now, here we go again. We got Starboard sending us hydrofoils. And earlier before that, I got to work with Alex Aguera. And, you know, this was my, my real first enthrallment with, with, stand, with, uh, with hydrofoiling excuse me um you know i tried it before with brett lickle when i was probably 10 years old but it was just like one time and i was able to get it up and going but my legs were too small for the the strapped in boots um because at that time it was on a first generation rush randall foil that brett lickle and you know all the boys like laird hamilton all those guys were using and you know they had one on the motu island and you know, they asked if I wanted to give it a go, and I threw my feet in it and was able to get a feel for flying, but never, I don't know. It just was a one-time thing and until until I saw, you know, Alex uh, testing these, these downwind foils, and I got involved with the, that early round of development with GoFoil, and I, it just changed uh, changed my world for sure. I mean – the first time getting out on a foil, uh, one of his go foils, I remember riding it all the way to the beach and thinking, this is the funnest thing ever. Like it was a, a, my, a day in Lahaina, which I grew up riding. And, uh, you know, Lahaina doesn't really ever get too exciting if you're, you know, used to surfing barrels or, you know, overhead waves. It's kind of more of a longboard spot. But with the foil, it was so exciting. I mean, these little knee-high waves, we were able to, you know, ride all the way to the sand and then even pump back out. And this was before pumping was even a thing. It was just like, wow, we could we could make our way back out there. Like, you know, it's just jumping, you know. And it's amazing how fast it's changed because um, that feels like that was just months ago, let alone years ago. And, um, you know, the, the gear has really changed. I mean, at that time, we were putting 12-foot-6 race boards onto downwinders with the foil. Yeah. And then we literally, with Sven Rasmussen, the owner of Starboard, and Connor Baxter, we, would, we were on the boat cutting a foot at a time off the board. <laughs> oh okay well 12 foot six didn't work let's try 11 six then there's Sven on the boat with the hack saw cutting a carbon fiber all-star race board just chopping foot after foot and then we got down to like I want to say we got down to maybe eight feet or nine feet long and the foil was just too far forward at this point it was like it, the, it was just a scrap and we're like okay well now we know uh let's just go small and 
after that, I put a foil on my shortly after that, maybe not immediately after that, but uh, modified a box, huddle box onto one of my hyper nuts, uh, a six nine hyper nut, which was one. I you know I've used that board a lot. Uh, stand up paddle surfing and I ha already had the board around in my garage and had this thing modified for a go foil and um, it, it was so fun to be able to get out on a downwinder and just not even touch the water from Maliko Gulch all the way to Kahului Harbor but not only that be, be going faster than I ever could have imagined and and having so much fun the whole way down. Um, it's, I don't think I've done a normal downwind on a sub board since, honestly. <laughs> <laughs> it's probably been about, uh, I'd say four or five years since I've done like a, a solid season of training on a, on a race board for downwinders. So you, you know, kind of gave I've up on the whole so... paddle racing scene? You, you gave up on that pretty much? I didn't give up on it. I just am having so much more fun doing other things and so much more other opportunities doing other things. You know, there's, there's a few years in my career and in my lifestyle where stand up paddle racing had the most opportunity. And it was, uh, it was, it was floating my lifestyle to be able to be a big wave surfer, a wind surfer, a stand up paddler. But really I was floating it from stand up paddle races and, you know, now, now I feel like uh, we have, we've had a little bit of a shift in trends, you know, stand up paddle racing is just taking a little bit of a dip and um, hydrofoiling and wing riding are just uh, taking off and my sponsors uh, are excited about it too. So if I love it and my sponsors want me to keep doing it, then uh, why go compete in a lake in Europe to go paddle 17 miles flat water for me it's it's not exactly where my heart is it but I'm all I'm definitely a guy who sees opportunity and so I knew that I could train and I could be a great paddler and I mean I've won most of my world championship event wins uh, that are under my bill are from racing you know and it's given me so much experience to travel the world and to you know get a taste of you know, really what it's like to be a, a true professional athlete and race racers. I definitely, definitely, um, it's different than surfers. You know, you, you get into diet, you get into training, you do everything you can to get that incremental increase. And so just transferring those skills that I've learned in professional stand up paddle racing into my surfing lifestyle, whether it's big wave surfing or foil surfing or windsurfing, I, I feel like I'm able to, you know, make goals and smash them. And it's, uh, whether, whether it's a mental obstacle or, a, 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 did I say mental? <laughs> whether it's a mental obstacle or a physical obstacle, you know, I think uh, between the preparations that an experience in these different areas of sport can, um, can implement it, you know, it, even if it's just a, uh, I, I'm just my wife and I are starting up our own uh, foundation this year and it's funny because a lot of the lessons I've learned in sport I'm transferring into business too and uh and, yeah but I, I know you love, you do a lot of the good good things like beach cleanups and, and cooking kids and all that kind of stuff right is that what your foundation is going to be doing too yeah, well, um, my our unofficial not for profit that I've ran for about twelve years is the Inzane Supergroms, and we've we've introduced over four thousand kids. We've lost track by now. It's been so unofficial, but definitely, I'd say over forty five hundred kids in the last twelve years to ocean sport and ocean um, activism and conservation. And so, our main goal, of course, is getting them stoked on and having fun with each other on the water. And then at the end of these, uh... I'm, I'm still listening. <laughs> oh, and then at the end of these uh, events, you know, get the kids hands on with the beach cleanup or some sort of uh, science and education exercise around coral reef or microplastics or the marine uh, biology and, and the eco diversity in the area, you know, there's it's it's a lot of fun so that's something i've been enjoying doing on on my travels and at home 
on the side of competing and and uh, and training, and it's really rewarding because I I give so much credit to where I am right now uh, as a professional athlete because of all the lessons and all the mentorship I've had from you know guys like Dave Kalama and and my dad and Brett Lickle and Archie Kalepa and I'm just so grateful to have had these these uh these positive influences in my life and so I think growing up my parents always encouraged me to, to share those same experiences and and now with COVID hitting you know all contests going to, to nothing you know it kind of was a good time I thought to, to really actually make our foundation official so yeah this is kind of maybe one of the first public announcements actually uh, but our our new foundation is Kahaku Kahi and um it's, right, well, we'll it's put a link uh, down we're below. so excited we'll it, yeah we'll, we'll link link to it and have a place um for people to get more information for sure um so um when when i asked you about doing this interview you told me you were laid up with stitches and so on so um and i just wanted to get into into the story i saw you just posted this video a few days ago on youtube so Tell us about this day. I just tell tell the whole story, what, what happened and stuff. Um, it started off as, you know, a pretty fun day, just trying to hunt for some waves. And I knew it was a pretty windy day, so I brought my wing foil and foil gear as well. And, uh, you know, um, scored some waves at Honolulu Bay first, surfing, and it was a blast. And the whole time I'm looking at the wind line just thinking, oh, it's cranking wind. And so I cut my, my surf session a little short to go, to go wing foil at one of my favorite training spots on West Maui. And it's kind of a little more countryside. There's usually, usually no one out on the water when I'm, if it's windy out. And uh, definitely the only person, you know, wing foiling the area. And so this same to go for this day. So I went out on my own for a quick session. Uh, the tide was pretty low, which is normal for this spot. So I'm just getting my, my board out upside down with the foil up. And, um, you know, a, a, a right before I cleared the reef, there is a set that came. And it wasn't a big set, but it was, you know, it was about head high, a little overhead. And uh, it was enough for me to um, hesitate letting go of my board because I had uh, no leash with my board. And so I held on to my board, like a, a just bear hugged it. And in the white wash, as I'm getting pounded, um, my foil swings around and nicks my leg. Or I might have even kicked the foil. I'm not even sure. Do you, and, know, um, which, do you know which part of the foil you hit or are you not sure? I'm almost positive, just from the shape of the cut, I'm almost positive it was the, the trailing edge of the tail wing. Yeah. Um, and – it wasn't very wide, but it was very deep. And that's why I say that because my tail wing isn't super wide. Um, but it, it went a good inch and a half, two inches all the way to the bone. Uh, and so that's why I think it was the tail wing. Um, yeah. And the plus is probably sharper too, right? <laughs> yeah. Exactly. And so I'm, I'm guessing it was that trailing edge of the tail wing and was able to kind of get in at an angle to, to go go down deep as opposed to slice and um so when i got you know it definitely hurt it felt like more of a charlie horse at first but as i'm getting back up through the waves i'm like i felt something flapping a little bit against my leg and i'm like i lift my foot up out of the water which you could kind of see in the video i'm like oh man this i cut myself and um just went straight in from there and um you know, I, I learned a lot through this, this video and as well through my doctor because I ended up um, doing a tying my leg a little bit with my leash. It just seemed like the right thing to do. It was already attached to my leg. And, um, you know, I tied off my, my, uh, my calf a little bit thinking, you know, I could slow down the bleeding. And um, that for everyone who's watched this video and I've included in the caption as well, you know, this big, biggest learning lesson for me is you probably don't need to tourniquet a, uh, an injury unless it's too big or messy of a cut to have a pressure uh, wrap on. And so a pressure wrap would be better. And um, 
you know, once I get back to my car, I realize, oh, I got duct tape. And so I ended up using duct tape. And, um, and the, I, I also didn't know I had like this little, I for, almost forgot I had this little um, first aid kit in my car and it had like these gauze pads. And so that would have been ideal instead of tying it, just um, putting the gauze or a clean shirt or something and then wrapping duct tape, a pressure wrap for a cut like this. Uh, the time that a tourniquet would be necessary from what I've learned is um, say if it was like a really wide open cut and you can't just put something over it to stop the bleeding. Mm -hmm. Like, um, and so, yeah, I, I could have actually made my, the, my situation worse if, uh, if I had a long drive, you know, luckily I only had about 30 to 40 minutes before I was uh, taken off the tourniquet and, and being seen by a doctor. And, um, yeah, so that was, that was my biggest learning lesson from that is, yeah, and I think for everyone for, who's into sports in general, but also hydrofoiling or surfing, that's over reef. You know, it's always good to have some sort of a first aid kit. This one that I had in my car was, was crap. I mean, it's a generic first aid kit. Now, after really having to deal with that, I'm like, I, you know, I've re reassessed my first aid kit and I have a, a nice, a good size bottle of alcohol and hydrogen peroxide. So immediately you could, you could wash the wound in the area around the wound. Um, you could have a bunch of gauze. I mean, there's my gauze is great and duct tape or, or, or ACE bandage. Um, Cause then you could act, do a pressure wrap. But um, I was lucky that I had some gauze cause I, I probably would have ended up just doing a dirty shirt or something. Yeah, it looks like that duct tape was the best move yeah, that you made cause then get it tight on there. Um, so yeah. I, I mean, obviously we have a little bit of a delay here. That's why we're sometimes talking over each other, have like um, little moments of silence. But um, so in terms of like your learning experiences, obviously you said to have a first aid kit that's suitable for deeper cuts and stuff like that. What about um, foil handling or, I mean, have you thought about just like sanding the, the trailing edge of your foil to make sure it's not as sharp or like any other learning experiences that you can pass oh 100 i mean to avoid all this just wear a leash you know like i i had a 10 foot surf leash in my car that i used for my surf session before and i actually i was like shoot i forgot my foil board leash which is normally a short and thick leash and um and I held my longboard leash in my hand for a moment. And I'm like, ah, nah, I'll just, I'll just no leash it today. You know, it's nothing too crazy out there. This is just another session. I'm always out doing this anyway. And I, and because I didn't have a leash on my board, I held on to my board and I kept it close to me. Whereas if I just had a leash on my ankle, even though it might not have been a dangerous day or anything that I can't um, control, it was a random situation where I, I, I chose to keep my gear closer than it needed to be. Um, and so I, that's the I biggest had a question. About this, I had a question about this video real quick. Um, it said that the clinic closes at three and you got there at three fifteen, and then, but then all of a sudden you're inside. Is that, is that the same clinic or did you have to drive somewhere else or what happened? No, I, I had to drive to a different clinic. All the way yeah. to Calgary? All right. No, not to call Louis. Luckily, there was another Lahaina clinic open that closed at four, and I was able to go visit them. Okay. Okay, cool. <laughs> yeah. yeah. I was wondering about that. But sorry, go, sorry, <laughs> sorry, go ahead. I should, I, should put, I should put like the little annotation or something on the video <laughs> so people know. <laughs> but yeah, it seems like these nurses are really cool. And, um, and then I was, I'm not going to show the whole thing. It's pretty, it's pretty gross, but then... You actually passed out while they were stitching you up, yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, the the funniest part was, you know, these nurses are, are they're foil and they surf, and we're already kind of friends. And okay. so, when they saw me come into the office, they're like, "Oh, what happened now?" You know, and <laughs> and we we got to we kind of we got to have fun with it and everything. But um, yeah, why, I asked if they don't mind me filming and they're like, yeah, it's cool. Just don't pass out on us all laughing. And I'm like, yeah, okay, uh -huh, whatever. I'll be fine, you know? And, you know, I normally am pretty good with, um, 
with with all with injuries and treating to, to you know being there to treat but I think I got a little overwhelmed because I'm stitching they're stitching me and I'm filming and then all of a sudden my mom called <laughs> and my mom when my mom called I went to go answer her phone call and as soon as I lifted the phone to my head I just remember saying, I think I'm gonna, and I just went out. And luckily the, the other nurse that was there like caught me from like rolling off the table. Oh. Uh -huh. <laughs> That's classic. Well, they also injected some um, like local anesthesia. Yeah, that was, that was that was on a step. Yeah. Yeah, because yeah, they, they really had to go deep in and clean it out. So they, they they shot me with some anesthesia, uh, whatever pain relief stuff, and yeah, and then they really got in there and scrubbed it with uh, with these um, you know these hospital grade bristles. Yeah, no, no, no. yeah so it's an important process to clean it because you don't want to get an infection, especially when you have a deep cut like that. You know, they they ended up doing three different layers of stitches: one against uh, the bone to close up the muscle, um, and that that bo or that bottom layer. And then another in the middle to kind of pull together that whitey, fleshy, fat looking stuff. And then another layer on top to close it all up. And, um, you know, by day two, I already felt an infection coming on where my leg was starting to get swollen. My glands were getting swollen. I called up the doctor and I'm like, hey, um, I think it's getting infected. And so I came in and, and sure enough, it was um, they needed to on day four, I think it was, they reopened the whole thing. They cut open all three layers of stitches and they had to do this process all over again where they got in and, and scrubbed it with this same Brussels thing and like, and just flush it with betadine and, and all that good stuff. And, um, and so, yeah, it, it got pretty bad actually to a certain point where I'm, I'm sure you're pretty familiar with, with staff and MRSA, Robert, you know, being yeah. here in Hawaii for so many years, but um it's uh, nothing to take lightly and um i've been hospitalized many times uh and threatened to even you know have uh limbs cut off if if it were to get any worse and so i was on top of it but this in infection happened so quick it, it was crazy and um it got to the point where I was like, they almost sent me to the emergency room to get antibiotic IV drip uh, just through my system where I'd have to pretty much stay there for 12 to 24 hours and be monitored. Uh, but luckily uh, we were able to catch it, you know, and they reopened it. They were really aggressive with the cleaning and the draining process. When they, when this uh, Dr. Heidi here uh, stitched me back up after reopening it and cleaning it, what she did was she placed a rubber a piece of tubing um, under the, um, the, 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 the stitches. And so at, for, the, for the following days, it could actually continue draining out um, as it's healing. And that's what really, I think, did the job, you know, um, was, was, you know, that getting back in there and cleaning it. Um, and, and now I'm on the mend. I think I'm in the clear um, and hopefully be back uh, back on the water in the next five days or so. Nice. Wow. What an experience, huh? Yeah, I've had the same thing happen on my back. Like I, I hit the back, uh, the reef with my back and had a big cut and they, they sewed it shut and then it got infected inside and we had to reopen it and stuff like that. It was pretty, pretty bad. So whenever you have um, yeah, deep cuts like that, you almost have to heal from the inside out, yeah. Otherwise, it's um, once you got the, the C bacteria in there, it's gnarly. Yeah. But anyways, let's not talk about that anymore. <laughs> it's, it's pretty gross. <laughs> yeah, we got we got viewers tuning out, getting yeah. boozy. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> Maybe we can, we can show some other stuff, but this, this is a, it looked like all sewn up, but yeah. Let's let's talk about wing fighting because that's kind of what my my show is is kind of really supposed to be about um wing foil. Well, it goes into some wing foiling there after the doctor clips oh yeah let's, if, um, let's play this one here wing winging it on west maui i watched this okay. one last night it's a good one um 
But yeah, so how long have you been wing foiling now? I could look back at my journals and probably get an exact date, but I mean, um, I, I want to say it was um, 2018 where I first got to try one with um, Alan Cadiz and Pete Cabrina at Kanaha where I was out windsurfing and I saw them using a prototype Cabrina one. And um, I remember thinking, you know, I, I saw it around cause you know, Kai had his videos floating around with, with one of his wings on early on. And, and this was around that same time. And I, I remember talking to uncle Alan and uncle Pete, I'm like, Hey, uh, what, can, can I sample? I, sample uncle and they both they both look at me with the most concerned look and they're like boy you don't have one of these yet and i'm like no i don't have one of those things yet like what i'm like try and they're like bro this is the only one we have like in all of hawaii besides the one kai has so yeah but just don't do anything crazy on it and i'm like okay and so and they were all pissed you know because I got up on the thing and right away just boom just I was up and riding and doing planing jibes and tacks and I came in like oh that's pretty fun thanks for letting me try and they're just all pissed like you just came in and out and we've been trying to do this for weeks and you and I I even threw a backflip on my first run out and I, oh, I remember yeah. thinking you know just just from all my windsurf experience right away and of course with the foil experience too it was easy to put it together. I got up, got up and riding. I'm like, okay, this is cool. What else can I do? <laughs> and just throw the motion of a back loop. <laughs> and I remember thinking like, oh, there's, there's some potential in this for some pretty fun stuff. And, uh, you know, I'm, I, and I very clearly remember sitting down that night and writing an email to, uh, to Sven and saying, hey, Sven, I know you've been a little skeptical, wondering if this wing thing is going to be a trend. But, um, you know, I, I think this thing's going to stick around. I think it's pretty functional, you know. Um, and, you know, sure enough, here we are. Uh, what, two years later, three years later, I don't know what it was. Winging is taking over the community, in, in Maui at least. I yeah. mean, on Maui, everyone's winging. It's crazy. Yeah. Yeah. It's really cool too. And more. The, the windsurfing crowd, but also the surfer, the prone surfers that got into foiling and now they want to wing foil. So it's almost like a bigger community than stand-up paddling or, or windsurfing was, eh? it seems like. more diverse. Yeah, just what's in many ways it's bringing everyone together which is cool it's it's bringing everyone into one community which it should be it should be the ocean community you know and and that's that's why i've really loved my experience with wing foiling is just like you said you know we're we're the real popular spot on maui right now is kahului harbor now that's also one of the more popular spots for canoe paddling um, it's also one of the more popular spots for foil surfing over at the break. And yeah. so now you have all these different communities merging together and everyone's kind of getting a little taste for, for the wing stuff itself. And, uh, uh, yeah, so it's, it's really cool to be able to also, I, I think the, the most unique thing though, is seeing surfers, shortboard surfers, you know, cause T to me, a lot of my friends who shortboard surf are the most closed-minded uh, when it comes to being multifaceted with multiple sports on the water. Yeah. Um, they just don't care to do anything else. They just want to surf. And if it's not good enough to ride the shortboard, they don't want anything to do with it. You know, and, and now I have friends who are like totally transitioned into foiling and wing riding where it's hard for them to even get on their shortboard anymore because they just have so much more fun and feel that sense of freedom that we get to feel. And I, I don't think surfers truly understand that sense of freedom that a wind sport has. Um, but it's, but you know, a lot of surfers has had the opportunity to get into hydrofoil surfing. Now hydrofoil surfing is a good stepping stone into downwind riding. And then once you get into downwind foiling, you're like, this you're t you're getting a taste of what that freedom is is like 
But as soon as you put a sail in your hand or a kite in your hand or a wing in your hand, I mean, you could just explore anywhere you want. It's, it's, it's a real special activity to, that really taps into the freedom of uh, accessing all these different places on the water and being able to just explore up and down the coastline. So, so Zane, obviously in this video, you're doing like 360s, you're practicing, like doing them over and over and over, trying to get them down. So can you kind of run us through the kind of step-by-step -step what exactly what you're doing and uh, like your hand placement and so on, just give us like a step-by-step -step rundown. Yeah, totally. And you know, if anybody's interested for, for some more of this step-by-step -step stuff, I have a zero to hero wing boarding tutorial on, um, on I believe it's a free wing YouTube channel. We have seven episodes currently, um, including a 360 deep, you know, really breaking it down. Um, should we, should we um, take a look at that one? Maybe? Probably better. So as I'm talking, get a, a better visual. Um, but yeah, I mean, I've also since COVID opened up my, my coaching and, and mentorship online to virtual classes. And so I started up um, the water sports division on blaze coaching .io, real popular soccer coaching platform online. And uh, we did a we did a partnership with them to do foiling, surfing, and stand up paddling, and, and so that's been a lot of fun too. People have been sending me a lot of foiling and wing clips lately, and uh, it, it's a lot of fun to be able to break down these different um, uh, maneuvers and and help people from home, you know, improve uh, improve their confidence on the water with the foil or with the wing. Um, yeah, so, you know, you've always been really into coaching and, and um, you know, kind of analyzing the, the technique, right? So, yeah, I think that, that, that's something yeah. I really like about your videos, too, kind of trying to break it down and make it easy to understand. But actually, yeah, the right video on. here is about tax and jive, so that's probably a little bit more applicable. So, but, um, yeah, yeah, yeah um, like for more, a little bit more entry level stuff. Yeah. So one of the one of the biggest things that people I think are asking me about or inquiring about on on my social media channels and as well through my coaching is how to better their jibes and tacks uh, with switching with switching stance. Um, a lot of people coming from a surf or stand up paddle background aren't as familiar switching their feet with each turnaround as say a windsurfer or a kiter might be. Um, so what I found to be a really, uh, easy breakdown of, of the jibe is to be able to first kind of do a little edge upwind. Don't just like kind of get lost going downwind because then you lose power in your sail. And so what I, what I, or your wing, excuse me, before you turn downwind for your jibe, do a little edge upwind to, to have power in the wing or just make sure you have power in your wing. And then you could actually follow through and lead through your turn. Um, do a nice turn holding the wing up above your head. And once your nose is pointing straight downwind, you can let go of your backhand and then start to transition your backhand to your front hand and your front to the back. And that's the point where then I'll start to do a little pump with the board up and down. And I switch my feet with the up and down motion. I found it to be a lot easier to go through that little quick motion of changing your feet from regular to goofy, goofy to regular in motion with that up and down pump with that roller coaster motion, as opposed to just trying to go straight, stay still, and then jump into position, you know? And so that's something to really keep in mind that a lot of my students have found to be super helpful is uh, do your turnaround first with the wing. Once you switch your hands, your cross stance, uh, then you could go up and down with a little pumping motion, little roller coaster. And then on your, before you start driving down from a higher altitude, you could slide your um slide your your back foot kind of to the middle position and do that quick transition from um from your your back foot to your front foot and 
of course, everyone's weight distribution and pivot point is going to be a little different according to their, their board and their foil. And it really just takes time um, getting that confidence and the quick shuffle. But remember that the wing is going to allow us to have the stability to do that, that shuffle. And also the slight engagement of the foil up and down. And so give your, your, your foil something to do with that up and down motion before you go into that, that switch. And also make sure you have a little bit of power uh, holding your weight up. So you can kind of do a little weightless uh, footwork. Um, now, uh, one of the best exercises to practice this kind of stuff I think um, for cross sport is, is longboard surfing, you know, rock, uh, doing your cross, cross stepping and stuff like that. Also, even just um, walking a curb in the parking lot before you go out, you know, walk the curb and, and cross step your feet and maybe practice doing some, some quick changes uh, with light footwork uh, from one stance to the next. Um, and uh yeah, for the most part, it's repetition. I mean, even for me coming in from a windsurf background, it took me a little bit of time to, to really dial in, getting comfortable. And, you know, still to this day, there's there's certain situations where I'll choose to stay in my goofy foot stance. Yeah, I mean, especially I guess you if you're going to do a maneuver board, or an aerial. When you have a really small board, it's actually pretty hard to switch stance on. Yeah, I mean, and, and you just don't have that much room for two foot straps and stuff in the front too, right? So here on Oahu, most guys that ride shorter boards, they just don't switch their stance. Um, but, and then another, another helpful tip is too, when you when you do switch stance in the beginning, it's good to just, after the jive, just drop down on the water, switch your feet and then come back up on the foil again. That, that makes it a lot easier, be, you know, until you, you're comfortable moving your feet around while you're up on the foil. Yeah, yeah totally. You could bring the board back down to the water and have that extra stability for sure. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, those are good tips. What about these jumps? Any, can you break those down? Yeah, so, um, you know, for a little bit there, I was like starting to get a little bit, um, bored with the 360 and this donkey kick because uh, it was like kind of like everyone was doing it and it seemed like it was one of the only tricks you could do right mm -hmm. and um sure enough you know that that motivated me and i'm sure a lot of other people to try and get creative doing other things um but these 360s definitely gave me a lot of excitement in between that transition you know because the donkey kicks were probably the first maneuver I, I worked on and really dialed um the 360s both front side and back side um both into the wind and downwind uh were really fun variations of maneuvers to work on um and so I, i'd say the easiest variation of the 360 is the downwind rotation um in your in your normal stance so not not switched not on your backside just going out with the in your in your natural stance or going in if your natural stance is going in holding the wing um doing a nice edge into the wind and then kind of a slight pull on the backhand as you kick your back foot out behind you and rotating downwind um, and that one is a really fun variation, but what helps is to, the quicker you transfer your hands. And so as soon as you, you give, you get off the water with a slight edge into the wind, then you could kind of give a little pull with your back hand, but it's more so just kicking out that back foot and almost doing like that 180 motion with the, with the, um, the foil board once you let go of your back hand, that's what's going to really um, uh, light up your rotation, right? And so if you want to slow down your rotation, like in that one right there, I held on to the last moment to kind of keep my rotation steady and not have a change of pace. But if you want to really speed it up, let go of that back hand, switch your hands, and you get that quick rotation 
Um, right? Yeah. Now, once you do come down, you got to switch your hands uh, really quick. Now, this was actually a different from what I was explaining, though, because that was a, a backside one. Yeah. So but that's a good example. There's there's four different variations of 360s you could do. You could do your um, natural stance, your switch stance, um, and then you could also do it with a downwind rotation or an upwind rotation. Have you tried the ones with the up? I've been trying to do the ones with the upwind rotation, but keeping the sail, uh, keeping the wing, and just kind of spinning the wind, wing through the wind. Have you tried those? It's so funny. Every time it looks like that. Every time I want to do one of those like 360s without uh, into the wind without letting go, I, I, I'd end up doing a backflip or like some oh, really? sort of a sideways backflip. Oh, and it's okay. funny because I have wing riders. Um, ah, shoot. I'm spacing his name. Um, one, of, one of the last, so there's that wing event in Brazil. I think exactly. the guy got sec second place. Oh yeah, um, Balls, Balls Miller, right? Yeah. Who got first place? Oh, Balls Miller. Oh, and then um, uh, what's his name? A younger kid. Yeah. Um, from New Caledonia, um, Tituan. Yeah, Tituan, Tituan. Yeah. So Tituan, um, actually messaged me, and he was like, "Dude." how in the heck are you doing your backflips like that? Like more like straight up and down. Yeah. And I, I responded back to him, dude, how in the heck are you doing your sideways spinners? Like, <laughs> you know, it's, it's just our unique style is more, I'm, I'm more naturally can throw the top to bottom, you know, um, more like up and down type of flip. Yeah. But I have a harder time with that more horizontal spinner. Right. And and Tituan seemed to have the opposite, where he maybe has a some sort of a block for the the straight up and down backflip, but can do the the sideways backflip slash three sixty, and so I've been actually playing around with it quite a bit, and still haven't felt super comfortable with that that maneuver, um, but I do feel like the backflips are keeping me real busy. I mean. The other day, I came pretty close to landing a double backflip. Oh, um, so maybe walk us through the backflip. I mean, like, yeah, like what's, I, I see you kind of, it's almost like you're doing a windsurfing backflip. You look for a steep ramp and you just throw yourself back. But can you kind of break it down step by step a little bit? That's something I've been wanting to try. The backflip. Well, as, as a windsurfer and for the windsurf viewers that are listening, um, you could relate to this, Robert, you know, approaching a, a lip a, or a wave for a back loop and a, and a push loop is a little different, right? So I was making the mistake early on with my back flips of going too far into the wind. And there is a certain point where just the wing would be like all up against my body and then and then it's hard to kind of bring the wing back in a position where it's getting powered up. Um, and so then I started approaching it more like a push loop where actually just before you hit the wave, go at a straight reach, maybe even a little bit on a downwind reach. And, and so just slightly downwind into the wave so that you could actually um, have the power in the wing throughout the rotation or throughout the majority of the rotation. And so you could see right there, there's a moment where the, 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 I back wind the, the wing, kind of like a push loop. Right. But I'd say it's easier to do this um, with a little bit of downwind as opposed to a little bit of upwind. And so right there, slight back wind. And then what you'd want to do is not have it get stuck in that, back winded position you want to be able to whip it right back up and over your head um so that the more the more you could have the wing powered up throughout the rotation the more smooth it's going to be okay so so you're saying um go a little bit upwind more like yeah like i guess like a push loop but then i mean do you, do you think about like throwing your head back like just trying to take so on the takeoff Totally. Yeah. So take off point, you point downwind slightly, 
And I like to think of it more so with the, you know, you, you angle the wing from pointing forward like it is now to all of a sudden you just drive your up hand, your, your forward hand up, your bottom hand around, and you're looking over your, your, your front, uh, over your shoulder behind your head and really throwing the wing like this, like whoop, back towards the beach. You kind of load up the power. So then you, you point it straight up in the air and then your, your, your hands continue that momentum behind you. Now all of a sudden you're swinging the wing behind you as your body's arched. And then from there, you just got to, you know, you, you time the arch depending on how big your jump is. You arch more if it's a big jump and you arch less and tuck if it's a small jump. For me, I have a lot more fun uh, throwing it off of waves because I could get way higher and I could just have more fun with the arch and, and play with it a bit more. Um, yeah. But the flat water ones, you, you really have to spin them quick. You want to like, it's, it's all with the flat water ones. It's more of that slicing, that slicing rotation. Like you kind of go full speed and you slice your foil slightly upwind a little bit. You hit that chop and immediately you're just throwing your feet up into the air as your wing is getting powered up to the sky and pulling and throwing behind you. And, uh, with the flat water ones, I think it's really important to pull that front hand, pull that front hand in and backwind the wing sooner rather than later. So you could kind of, kind of uh, fold the, the fold the, the flip as opposed to kind of the smooth roll. Yeah, right on. Um, Cool. Thanks for that breakdown. Um, let's talk a little bit about um, gear and stuff. So, like, so what, like, um, what have you learned about, you know, the foil gear, the wings, and all that kind of stuff? Like, um, any anything you can share on that? Just um, um, all top secret stuff. I mean, not really. <laughs> <not sure. laughs> yeah, I mean, I I try and ride whatever I can. You know, I'll I'll try and give test test rides on on all the gear because i think i think there's a lot of um concepts floating around but everyone's kind of doing the same thing you know um or at least in the past it's been like that everyone was making the same type of thing um type of uh uh design now you have people getting a little more out of the box and a little more risky with the designs and concepts and so testing gear right now is more exciting than ever um i of course work close with uh starboard and ak durable supply co so the most majority of my sessions i'm riding the starboard foils or the ak foils um i've found that i'm just wanting to go smaller and smaller that's one of the biggest things that i've noticed with a lot of my wing riding lately is um Anything with the wing in my hands, I'm probably going to be using a 1300, uh, a 1000, or an 800 on Maui. Um, and so quite small wings as opposed to what you might be riding in, in the waves. Um, my most used wings, uh, wing size for the actual wing thing, <laughs> the inflatable wing, is a four meter and a five meter, believe it or not. Um, especially because I like a smaller hydrofoil wing. Um, I kind of sometimes prefer to have that little extra power to get me up and going. Um, but of course on Maui, you get away with the, the three meter a lot. And, and those days where you do have the three meter, oh, you could really just feel so lively to be able to, uh, you know, do some quick, quick rotations and flips and things like that um but there's something about the four meter and the five meter that just floats i mean if you just want to fly high and and float um i i usually end up going one bigger than i want um yeah 
And um, um, I mean, usually for beginners, um, we we usually recommend going with a bigger foil just because it makes it easier to come up out of the water and it's more stable and you can fly slower. Hundred percent. Then I guess yeah. I mean, the hundred percent. The smaller foils are just once you get on a wave, um, just because the big foils they're just not fast enough to keep up with the bigger waves or faster moving waves, right? So I mean, and then for turning and carving and things like that, just the smaller yep. you can go, the better, really, almost, right? Yeah, the, the idea is, you know, the, the bigger, the more lift, the smaller, the less lift. Um, now, with less surface area and a smaller wing, you also have the opportunity to go faster. Um, so, you know, I, I would say if you're learning, you want to go on something around 1600 to maybe even 2000 if, if you're a bigger guy. Most of my lessons that I teach on, at our foil school here on Maui, because we've been teaching hydrofoil as one of our primary activities at our surf school. Um, it's, you know, most of our lessons are getting guys out for the first time on a 1600 behind the boat or jet ski. And, uh, you know, there, it seems to be a pretty comfortable size to not be moving too fast, um, but have, have nice slow speed lift. And, and control um, but as you start getting better uh, one of the things that you're going to start to notice maybe before speed is that ability to roll into your turns and so as a as a intermediate or beginner rider you might not want to be rolling into turns so much you want to do more flat pivotal turns where you're keeping the board flat and you're just doing these direction changes keeping the board flat but you know, as you start to get better, it, it you can have a little bit more uh, opportunity for maneuvers, you know, by leaning into and rolling into your turns. The wider your span is on your wings, the the harder it is to, to roll into turns. And so that's one of the biggest reasons why I've really wanted to go smaller with wing riding, because a lot of the time you're edging right before going into the air for a big jump and a flip. I'm edging into the wind for that last little bite of power, right? Or edging downwind a little bit to, to kind of release power. And so being able to have that little extra control of, of edging into the wind or downwind, turning side to side is important because as soon as the tip of the wing breaks the surface, if you're rolling over and you have a wide wingspan, it's you're not going to be able to lean over as much before that wing hits hits the water and breaks the surface and then gets aerated and you lose um you lose all your um uh all your lift because air gets under the wing and so yeah i think if you're um looking for more performance stuff you know think about the width of your wing not necessarily just the size yeah, and that's why also like the super high aspect wings are not necessarily that easy to ride because yeah, when you turn them, when you try to turn them, they breach more easily because they're so wide. They have such a wide wingspan and they don't have that curve. So having a kind yeah. of lower aspect sometimes in, in the waves, it's actually easier to use a narrower foil right? that's not as wide. Um, but as I'm sure you're starting to see in your you know local foil spots, it's there's different types of foilers. You know, you have some people who are just really into pumping. Some people who are, who could care less about pumping and they just want to get their turns to be a little more critical and just make it look more like a shortboard maneuver, you know? And then you get other guys who, who really want that uh, just smooth ride um, and be able to not really turn too much, but just feel like they're Cadillac. They're just cruising, you know? And so, depending on what style you want to achieve uh it's going to determine your 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 gear you know and so if if you like to pump around and you like to connect waves and you want to just stay up and riding then hey a high aspect uh foil um you know 13 to 1600 is probably going to be really nice you might really like just pumping around catching plenty of waves but if you want to do um you know, start to do break the, the tip and do really nice 
snappy turns and really sharp radius turns than maybe a more uh, medium aspect, low aspect foil um, is going to help for, for those sharper turns. Right. So you were saying you do beginner lessons for foiling and stuff. So um, maybe can you talk a little bit about like the most common mistakes you see people make and like give some pointers for just beginners, I guess the, the, the very beginning uh, foiling tips, like what, like, cause sometimes once you get more advanced, it's kind of harder to think about like uh, the challenges of learning it, you know? But. Yeah, totally. Um, <clears throat> One of the, one of the biggest things that I think helps for the student is to kind of start with a clean slate, try to approach this sport humbly um, and almost forget about your previous board riding knowledge because our surf knowledge, if we stick to it, could hinder us. Um, I also recommend doing some sort of mentorship or lesson if possible. Because, um, you know, you, I've seen a lot of people who are very talented athletes, you know, just beat themselves up and spend more money than they need to, both on gear and maybe even medical bills. You know, <laughs> there's, a, there's an appropriate way to do this. And I, I tell you what, it's learning behind the boat or jet ski with a coach and in a controlled environment with the appropriate learning gear. You know, if, if you're a first time rider, you buy a, a kite surf foil on Craigslist and you mount it to your short board and you try to go paddle around, I tell you what, you're gonna have a hard time. Um, so if you can get behind a boat or jet ski um, and start off with very little movements keep your body and the majority of your weight over your, um, your front foot, which is kind of counterintuitive from, from other board sports. And also keep your center of gravity straight over that foil or a uh, kind of more so you could think standing upright, which is also counterintuitive from surfing. You know, a lot of times surfing, we want to get really low. And sometimes our, our butt and our chest has a tendency to get over the water. Foiling, we really want to try and bring our weight over the foil. And so in the beginning, I'm always reminding my students, check your center line. Make sure your feet are completely along the stringer or the center of the board. Make sure you're starting off with the majority of your weight over your front foot to keep the board on the water. Make a goal of keeping the board on the water before you get into flight. And then from there, you from control on the water, you could slowly distribute your weight back towards your back foot and slowly achieve lift. Now, one of the biggest things that's going to help with the smooth transition here is to immediately shift forward again. Because achieving lift is so much more easy than controlled landing so as soon as you start to feel like you have control with the board on the water your body over your front foot then check your posture kind of stand up erect keep your your, your body kind of more upright and control that weight distribution back towards your back foot and as soon as you feel that lift shift forward again nice and smooth and bring the board back down because that transition from nose up to nose down, lift to land is what's going to give us all of our control. It's that transition up to down, you know, that transition from water flowing on the bottom side of the wing to the top side of the wing. So as soon as you feel that lift shift forward again, and then you could take it slowly from there a little higher and shift forward, bring it back down a little higher, shift forward. And instead of bringing it down, just neutral, level it out. You're not going higher. You're not going lower. You just have it level. You're focusing on your eyes and your breath, your, your eyes focusing out in front of you and also focusing on your breath, minimizing your movements because 
the, the, the best thing you could do, especially if we're talking controlled speed behind the boat, holding the rope is keep your movements minimal and control your weight distribution from the front to the back and back to front. Um, um, do you have people like when they're behind the boat, do you have to go kind of try to get out of the wake or do you have them straight behind the boat? Totally. Yeah. You, I think, I think you'll feel real quick, those bubbles from the wake and this, uh, these, you know, you want to immediately get out of the bubbles and out of the wake in order to feel a little bit of control and feel that smooth sensation, the foil moving through water. You know, I, I kind of relate it to an airplane. Like, would you rather be flying on an airplane with turbulence the whole time? Or would you rather be flying in smooth air? You know, it's the same thing. If you want controlled flight, then try and find smooth water outside of the turbulence from the engine. All right, yeah, those are some really good pointers for beginners, I think. Well, I appreciate you for sharing so much love to my YouTube channel, Robert. Yeah, I got to, I mean, that's the whole idea. Play some videos while, while you're talking, right? So talk a little bit about, I know like on Instagram, you were showing some, um, I had some footage of you um, wing foiling at Jaws getting like, um, I guess you were um, actually let go of the wing and then just surfed it without the wing. Can you talk a little bit about that? Yeah, totally. So that was really exciting. Um, I was a little underprepared as far as my equipment goes because I only had um, my smallest wings I could get my hands on from AK was a 800 square centimeter. And this is something that I pump around on and surf with in, in shoulder high waves. But it was the smallest thing I had. So I decided I would um, uh, build my experience out at Peahi with and see see how it works and so i was out on uh, my normal setup that we saw there in that video uh four eight um a four eight board with an 800 square centimeter foil and um i didn't have a jet ski or or a budget to pay for a team and so i went out there thinking hey if, if it's a tow day and um or if it's windy I'm not going to miss on the action. I'm just going to pump up my wing and, and go wing into some waves and, and have some fun. And, and uh, I was just thinking of it as like a way to stay out there and have fun, right? Accessibility opportunity. And, um, and so, yeah, I, I ended up having a lot of fun getting into some waves with the wing. And that was the first day anyone's ever taken a wing out at, um, out at Peahi. And, um, it was not as functional as I thought with that, with that foil though, um, and the wing itself. Because I couldn't get going fast enough with the speed of that wave, I kept feeling the sensation that I was stuck at the top of the wave or at the middle of the wave using my wing. And so eventually, with, because what happens, the, the wave moves so fast and it hits the trade winds to the point where the wind is literally going straight up. It hits the wave and it just creates a parent lift going straight up. And so as I'm dropping in down into the wave, the force of the apparent wind against my inflatable wing is, is more. And so I want to drop in, but it's actually lifting me out the back. And so I thought, I'm just going to ditch my wing. I took, I went back to the channel. I took my leash off of my wing. I, I, um, you know, I kind of, uh, gave a little heads up to one of the jet ski drivers and I was like, Hey, I might let go of my wing. Can you get it? And he's like, okay. And, um, so I went, I went into the wave and right as the, the parent wind started to catch me and lift me up, I let go of my, my wing and was able to just continue riding the wave with my hydrofoil. But you know, even then I realized it's not just my wing that's slowing me down. It's actually my hydrofoil too. I mean, my 800 centi square centimeter hydrofoil, I felt like I was completely maxing the thing out, just leaning so far forward, trying to keep the thing controlled. And um, yeah, so I couldn't quite go as 
deep as I wanted to or get as critical or really ride how I wanted to. But regardless, I got to build experience foiling out at Peahi and I got to learn a lot about um, uh, what kind of equipment might work and what isn't going to work out there. And you know, after talking with Kai, he, he kind of was like, dude, you're crazy. I can't believe you're out there with that foil. And I'm like, what do you mean? And he's like, I would never ride anything like this size on anything bigger than like a 300. And I'm like, Oh shoot. Okay. Well, 300, 400, that's a hell of a lot smaller than 800, yeah. you know? So, um, I, I was happy to be able to pull off what I could with what I have, you know, I don't have the big budget to make custom wings or a big budget to have water safety and jet ski teams, but I got to have so much fun that day uh, with the self-assist with the wing and, and riding with the foil. And uh, it was a good day for it because it wasn't super crowded. Um, yeah, that's but awesome. I'm, I'm waiting for my big wave foil, though. I, I told Starboard and AK, I'm like, dude, I need a foil to push, start building more experience in big surf because I'm comfortable in big waves. I really want to push the limits. I just need something that will allow me to handle that speed and, and that force. For sure. I mean, a few days after that, I think Kai Lenny was riding. Um, I mean, he was posting some a video of him, like, getting these huge airs on the, on, on, you know, off the face of the wave and, like, floating down jaw, the face of Jaws. And, this is insane. Yeah, and that, was, crazy, that but, was actually just with a normal tow board. Yeah, he, so he that got was, pulled into those waves, right? Yeah, so that was, I want to say... Um, the end of Jan, I, I don't quite remember when he did that, but the, the day that I went out was January 3rd and 6th with the yeah. wind wing. And um, later, Kai Lenny went out, I want to say later in January, and he got toe surf. His, his tow team pulled him with, uh, with the, the tow rope on the jet ski and one hand with the wing and then got into it on his tow board, no foil, and then as soon as he grabbed onto the wing, it was pretty much fly time because of that apparent wind I was telling you about. Right. And so, you know, there's definitely something to be said about opportunities for, for just no foil on a tow board, having fun with that apparent lift. And if you're a, if you're a hang glider, um, then you know, you look for those locations where you have that apparent lift to give you that nice long flight. When you, uh, when you slide off mountain, I mean, this is essentially the same thing, except the mountain is moving into the wind. And, <laughs> and so honestly, I can't wait to try that. That, that looks so freaking fun. Uh, what, yeah. what Kai did with the, uh, with the tow board and the wing. Yeah. I'm really excited to give that a go. Um, it's pretty insane. Uh, I just, it's a, uh, it's a little hesitate tent for me though. Um, as I'm goofy footed. And so as soon as I got get off the water um, in, that, in that situation with my bot, lower body all twisted, my upper body, my lower body wants to start doing a 360. And so it's like, <laughs> but uh, I'm going to get, I'm going to find someone to tow me in like that and give that a go once, once my injury heals up for sure. Yeah, it's amazing. You get so much float out of that jump, like this, this one here. Um, oh, like yeah, a lot the of wind just goes straight up the face, right? So it's like it's just floating in the air. It's so cool. Exactly. Yeah, yeah. If you see Zane, tell. I mean, if you see Kai, tell him I'm interested in talking to him about that too. I'm gonna try to, I'm gonna try to yeah. Do that. Let's just talk a little bit about you know life, life, nutrition. Um, you know what you do to stay sane during the pandemic and stuff like that. I mean, yeah. And any advice for people? I mean, I know, like, you know, during the pandemic, I know so many people are, you know, struggling with, you know, loneliness or addiction and things like that. Depression. Yep. So, you know, any any lifestyle or any tips on living living your best life? You know. Well, as as you know, Robert, we're very fortunate with our our location here through, through this pandemic. Um. But we, we still have experienced, you know, a taste of the, lo the lockdown and business closures. And, you know, um, it was a pretty crazy time, even on Maui. I'm not sure what it was like on Oahu, but, I mean, it was wild. And 
Um, I'm very grateful that I was able to be home through this because there is a, a, a short time there where I was stuck in Indonesia through February. And um, all of a sudden, borders were closing, airlines are shutting down, and I couldn't get home. No matter how much money I had, I couldn't get home. And um, it was scary at that point. But luckily, you know, we were able to find a flight home and I made it back. And, and so I, I started off this pandemic with a good attitude because I was facing the reality that I might be in a foreign country without my family uh, through this really uncertain times. I mean, early February, when I started, when literally all of Bali shut down and my contest I was there for canceled all of a sudden i tried to get flights home you couldn't even get connected with the airlines they're busy lines shut down too busy and so it was for me to get home and be with my family was like a sigh of relief um but then i started realizing this is actually real serious like i started losing a lot of uh my uh, sponsorship funding um, our business shut down. Our surf school had to legally shut down. Um, our um, all, pretty much all our whole community had to stay inside for a certain time. And um, you know, I, I started to kind of feel like, whoa, this is this is uh, our whole lives may change. And I didn't want to let that consume me too much. And so I. Um, I tried to stay as busy as I could, however I could, whether it was, you know, keeping up with home workouts while at home, um, doing push-ups and pull-ups and sit-ups and, and rebuilding my website and catching up on emails and all that computer work that I always put aside because I'm having too much fun in the water. So, you know, that first month was like a lot of catch-up. I was able to catch up on stuff and and then the second month came and I'm like, oh, this is still happening. And, you know, still not making money for anything, not our, any of our businesses or sponsors. And, and so I started to realize I need to get creative making some money. And, and so, you know, I started offering online coaching through, uh, since we couldn't do coaching at our school, I started doing online coaching. And I, I got a lot of people doing wing full and foil uh video submissions for personal coaching and and that kept me pretty occupied for a bit um one of my big goals that that's been lately keeping me really motivated is uh starting my foundation you know i mentioned earlier i have a had an unofficial not-for-profit for over 12 years called the insane super Grums. And now we've, uh, we've decided to go all out, get our 501c3 and get us in a position where we could do more for the kids in our community. And so our mission at Kahaku Kahi is to inspire Keiki to choose healthy, active lifestyles that uplift our community and the environment through mentorship and sport. And, uh, and so, you know, we try to get kids stoked on, on surfing or paddling and foiling and in return, um, inspire them to be ocean guardians themselves and, and care for this, this uh, natural environment that, that brings so much opportunity into our lives. And, uh, you know, we offer scholarships and equipment. And, um, and so now that I actually have this 501c3 filed and we got our website going and um, What's the website? hoping to... If someone wants to donate, where do they go? They could go to kahakukahi.com, and that's K-A-H-A-K-U-K-H-I.com. Or they could reach out to me through any of my social media, and I'll share the info. Our website is not public yet. We're still working on launching, and, and um, we should have our 501c3 paperwork within the following months. So we're so my wife and I are really excited about that because uh, now it will give us a chance to um, – you know, uh, maybe even get more kids that we want involved in these programs because in the past, you know, we weren't legally allowed to pick up people. They had to already have rides. 
now that we have a foundation, we could actually pick up at-risk kids, underprivileged kids, alternatively abled kids, and be able to physically take them to the beach and, uh, and, and get them set up with scholarships for equipment, for mentorship, for uh, education and science-based um, uh, programs, and 100% uh, with the goal to give these kids passion on the water and a reason to, uh, to be guardians of our community and environment. And so uh, that's been keeping me so excited lately. And, you know, especially with this injury now, I um, can't be in the water at all. You know, it's been, it's been really fun. Um, but for, for everyone out there who is on more serious lockdown, I mean, I have friends out in the Philippines and, and all over Asia where still it's, it's serious lockdown and um i mean the best thing we could do in these times is 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 try and keep our mental and our physical fitness up you know and our mental and physical health is so important and so it's too easy to get caught up looking at facebook or youtube or, or netflix all day if you're locked up in your home give make a goal give yourself one hour start with just one hour to yourself whether it's whether it's trying to do some stretching some breathing a little bit of physical fitness and exercise uh, even if you have a tiny little studio apartment maybe that means just doing some Wim Hof breathing maybe that means doing some push-ups and pull-ups maybe that means doing some some journaling you know um and getting familiar with a daily routine that you could have, that's all you. No distractions. Because I think even for myself, it's, it's so easy to just wake up and, you know, get sidetracked in work or in social media or in caught up with the overwhelming whatever you have going on in life. And I noticed that if I don't give myself that time, which is usually best in the morning for me, first thing, just give myself that time to, to know how I feel, to know what I want, to know, um, to, you know, it, it helps me throughout my day. Yeah, sorry to interrupt. Um, um, do you have like a routine of things that you do every morning, like a, a certain routine that you Everyone. Yeah, for, I I do, for so, can you share exactly like what you do after you get up? I love to drink tea. So tea is a good routine for me. I'll wake up, I'll get some tea going. I like to do my morning journaling. Um, my morning journaling consists of a meditation that's instilled in it. Uh, it starts off with writing down three things you're grateful for. And so, and this was a practice my grandmother left with me. Um, she, she told me that gra at, um, with the attitude of gratitude, you'll never have an excuse to be unhappy. When you're grateful, you'll always have something to be happy for. And so through these times, I think it's more important than ever to stick to my journaling routine. And I've, I've kept up to this over the last 10 years, almost to the day, no matter where I am in the world. And so I try and I'm keeping to that, you know, my morning journaling starts with gratitude and then it starts with three things that I could do to make today great. Three things that would make my day feel proactive or feel, um, feel successful. And first thing in the morning, I'll, I'll sit there and it might even take me 10 minutes to really think like, what do I want to accomplish today? According to how I feel. According to my current state of mind and my well-being, like, what do I want to do today? And, and just those three little sentences that I write down, that determines every choice I make for the rest of the day. Then if I'm met with the choice to watch a Netflix show or to work on my website, because I did that little journaling in the morning, I'm not going to get sidetracked and procrastinate. I'm going to get straight to one step closer to my day being successful to my day being one step more amazing right and then i'll also finish it with um a daily affirmation and a community um 
a community goal, which I call a blue life choice. And Robert, if you've been following me over the years, you've probably seen this hashtag I've been sharing, you know, uh, live a deep blue life, deep uh, hashtag, deep blue life, hashtag blue life choices, hashtag embrace the power of choice. You know, this is my way of, of taking my daily journaling and meditation, which is very selfish. But that's the point of it, right? It's to, it's to tap into our own. It's to figure out how, what we want to accomplish for how we're feeling. But I believe from over 10, 15 years of journaling that my most, my most prized days that have stuck with me, both in my mind and in my heart, and stand out the most when I recall my journals, are the days in which I could accomplish a goal that helps someone else or that helps our community. And so a blue life choice is my, is my way to recite an action that will uplift my community or environment around me. It could be something as simple as planting a tree or, or, or supporting the local farmer's market, or it could mean doing some coaching online with one of my students who, who's been been you know wanting to do some coaching maybe it can mean sending a, a thoughtful message to a friend or family member that you haven't talked to in a long time heck it could even mean writing a review on a product that has changed your life you know or it could mean you know a number of things it's the the possibilities are endless you know and the more you start to practice gratitude and the more you start to bring in others into your daily choices, the easier it starts to become to be grateful and to be there for others and to be there for your community. And I think that's why I'm so happy. I owe so much. It gives me chicken skin because I think back to my grandma giving me my first journal. And, you know, she said, Zane, if you journal, you'll, you'll never forget your experiences with the world and its people. And if you're embrace the attitude of gratitude, you'll never have a reason to be unhappy. And I owe so much of my success, my mind state and my values to this simple practice of taking a few minutes each morning and even each evening to journal. I've, you know, I even take that same practice into the evening but then I'll write down three things that made today great, three things that I actually did and accomplished that made today great, and then I'll write down something I could have done to make today better. That's and, awesome, I, I love that. And, and so for, for me, it's, it's the base of my mental, um, my mental health, but it's also, the foundation for my manifestations and my journaling and my, my power of choice. Because we, we might not know it, but we, we rely so much on our subconscious calls to action. And so we sometimes have to, you know, be a little more conscious with these, with these uh, practices that, that we know are going to be, be more that are going to, be healthier for us and um you know yeah i might i might rather get on youtube and watch some killer surf videos or or um or go run out of the door and surf even but i know if i don't do my journaling in the morning i'm missing out on an opportunity i'm missing out on on bringing my day to the fullest i'm missing out on on truly tapping into how i feel today yeah good awesome all right. Well, I think we went way longer than I <laughs> asked you to schedule, but I really appreciate that. That was really cool stuff at the end. I think that. Oh yeah, we did. Good, good life, um, good life uh, advice. But um, <laughs> I don't know what what do you want to leave people with, and like who do you um, who you, you want to plug anyone, spot your sponsors, or like I know because I think. You, last time you met, you gave me your book, and and you talk about the journaling in there too. I mean, I guess a lot of it, um, you know, the, the kind of also your your stories. You, I guess I guess it's, 
I, I've, I've had journaled since I was like 18 years old, I think, but maybe I should start doing that again. It seems like a, a good way to start your day for sure. I like that. Well, I'll, I'll share with you my favorite journals if, if you're if you're looking for them, because there's a, a few that I like that um, that really fit this style of journaling. Um, and I'm actually working on publishing my second book, um, which is a this exact style of journaling we just talked about, um, you know, with uh, those blue life choices incorporated into them. And so um, I guess to leave everyone off, I'd like to share my gratitude for all my supporters online like over the years i've 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 tried to separate my life online and 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 personally because i i find it inauthenticates myself but i've found that through these times i'm so grateful for my online community because it, it's given me a voice through this, these times, it's given me a platform to stay, to feel like I could keep busy and to keep sharing with others. And I think that's a huge part of me. And um, I didn't really realize that truly until I was stuck at home on quarantine. It's how grateful I am for all of you guys that tune into my, my Facebook or Instagram or, or watch my newsletter every Friday or you know, it's, um, and for those guys who take it a step further and actually get to share surfs with and, and get out in person with, I mean, yeah, yeah, I think we all won't take those experiences for granted after this time with COVID. But, um, but yeah, thank you to, to all the viewers and also to my sponsors that I have today. They're still behind me, even through these challenging times, uh, Starboard and, and AK Foils and, um, Maui Gym Sunglasses, Honolulu Surf Co., you know, Celsius Energy, Now Foods. Appreciate it. And Robert, you too, for giving me a chance to, to talk story with you. Sorry. Oh, sorry about that. Here at the end, the Wi-Fi disconnected and I lost Zane at the end. But uh, I hope you got as much out of this interview as I did. I learned a lot. hope you did too. And if you like this show, also check out next week's interview with Baltz Muller. And uh, we post a new video every Saturday at 7 a.m. Hawaii time. So make sure to subscribe to the Blue Planet Surf YouTube channel down below. And give it a thumbs up if you enjoyed it. Ask questions and comments, uh, questions for future interviews that you want to know about. And uh, we'll try to answer it all. So thank you so much for watching. See you on the water. Aloha.